Hi everyone, Jonathan here with some pretty obvious looking firearms. Um, as a lot of you will know, this series is tied to our social media, essentially quiz series. Uh, what is this weapon? It's not just a YouTube series, it is in fact something you can follow along with on Instagram or Facebook. And ahead of time, try to guess what it is we're going to uh, be showing you. Which is why I sometimes take a while to get to the point in these videos, because uh, we like to, we like to um, make the game more exciting, more interesting. So, to get to it, <laughs> these are in fact, to those, those, those of you who guessed, M16A2, yes, correct, video over, only not quite, because. Let's start with this one. So this is, near as damn it, a Colt M16A2. Uh, plenty of other places you can learn about the, the M16, the AR15 series. Um, but there are obvious reasons that I have chosen these two to show you today. Uh, they are both M16A2s. However, what a lot of people don't realize is that the M16A2 was a product range, not just a military designation for the US service rifle of this configuration. So just to quickly go through what that, what that means. So when, uh, or in the early 80s, when the um, uh, M16A1 began to give way to the A2, a number of features uh, were agreed upon across the different armed services of the US. Firstly, a heavier barrel, or at least heavier for the front section, uh, somewhat controversial um, in that it's arguably heavy in the wrong place, but we won't get into that technical side of it. Uh, a revised, uh, what we call in Britain a flash eliminator, or you might call a flash suppressor, where it is closed on the bottom. So the A1 rifle was only was open all the way around, and it was just to break up those combustible gases and stop them from flashing, or limit them from flashing. The A2 introduced a solid bottom so that that's only happening upwards, which gives you a very slight compensating effect, um, and also prevents kicking up too much dust when you're firing in the prone. So that, that was a feature I think everyone could get behind. The heavy barrel, a uh, little bit controversial and adds significantly to the weight versus the classic a, a Vietnam and later era M16A1. These round handguards, interestingly enough, first appeared in 1967 in this basic design. Not a lot of people know that. Um, but they went away again and didn't come back until the A2. The upper receiver changed um, little details like the uh, forward assist button change shape. Notably, this big case deflector bump was added, which greatly improved um, not getting hot brass in places you didn't want to get hot brass. Uh, the pistol grip received a finger groove effect with a bump here. Some people don't like that, but um, became the standard. The buttstock was lengthened and by now has a... a trap in the butt for storage. Um, again, this, this, this buttstock length is also argued about. And the real kind of elephant in the room of the M16A2, the burst feature. So we're not here to get into the technicalities of the three round burst, um, but we will, I suppose, touch upon the controversy around whether that was necessary or not. This was really an attempt to control um, effective rate of fire. So these things have a cyclic rate of 750 to 850 rounds per minute. And a constant concern of commanders is that the soldiers are wasting ammunition. And it was thought to be more efficient to have a group of three rounds, a burst of three rounds. The soldier can control the rifle for long enough for the three rounds to leave the gun. Uh, and then he'll experience the recoil or uh, you know, along those lines. Well, that, that doesn't work unless you go for something like a hyper burst where the two bullets or three bullets are gone before the recoil is, is felt against the shoulder. In practice, what you find is the first shot's on, the second and third are off, just like when you're firing in automatic. So, not, I think, I, think, I think we can say that was definitely a bad move because the M4A1 variant that's now replaced most of the M4s, the successors of the M16 effectively, have gone back to automatic. And the last feature I need to point out to you before we, we give you the angle here. What's the angle? What's he talking about? Well, finally, the A2 pattern sights. So it changed the shape of the carrying handle, therefore the upper receiver, and they are now adjustable. So instead of just being flip up, flip down, two options, you now can adjust, uh, without having a tool or a cartridge, you can adjust um, 
windage and elevation. The US Marine Corps was particularly keen on adjustable sights. I gather um, the Army less so. So that, all that background is, is important because what we've got here, this one, this is a British purchase, M16A2. So something I'm researching at the moment for a symposium paper over at the Cody Firearms Museum later in the year is the British experience of the AR-15. That's the broad family and including the M16. I'm doing that with uh, Matt Moss of the Armourer's Bench. He's going to be picking up uh, other aspects of it. I'm in particularly interested in the sort of technical development side of it. So this was, this was in fact a British service M16A2, basically indistinguishable from the issue, the USGI M16A2. However, even this one is a bit different. So if we show you the roll mark on the lower receiver, you'll see that it is a commercial roll mark. It does not say property of US government. Um, it does say M16A2, but it says it in a sort of cult logo fashion, because as I mentioned, the M16A2 was a whole range of products containing all sorts of different barrel lengths and configurations. Um, and it's just the one we know from real life mainly, but also um, playing games and watching them in movies and stuff is um, the M16A2. Right, so far so completely ordinary. Now the only thing about this that makes it not a USGI, general issue, um, M16A2, are those markings. Um, it does have a uh, commercial proof mark on it. But there are no other markings on the bolt or anywhere else on it. There's nothing that makes this British military service. So this, this was a sort of test and evaluation example, and it's only technically different from the US standard. So it's a useful benchmark for what we're really here to talk about, which is the Colt Model 715. Now, the 702 and indeed the 701 both found their way into um, British service, uh, Special Operations Forces, to be precise. So this thing is actually the closest we've got to a US military, a US general issue, USGI as it's known, M16A2. The markings aren't right for that, and it has a little commercial proof mark on, uh, on the bolt and on the upper receiver, so, but it's not British military. But what we're mainly here to talk about today is the Colt Model 715 because this is the version of the M16A2 that was, um, I suppose, general issue might be the wrong word, a substitute standard, to use an American military phrase. So in other words, while the rest of the Army's using L1A1 SLR 7.62 semi-automatic rifles, if you were in the right unit, uh, Pathfind, uh, Pathfinder platoon, for example, or you were in the right part of the world, in the jungle in the Far East somewhere, your unit might get issued what we called an Armalite. And by that we meant either first generation AR-15, an M16A1, or an M16A2. When the Canadian DeMarco ARs come in, the name kind of starts to drift away, but it's, it's interesting, we still see Armalite used by, um, by the British. Um, the new Ranger unit that's, that's been raised uh, or created the spec that went out for a new rifle for that used the word Armalite. Now, it can mean other things, of course. Armalite was the design company that made, uh, that designed the AR-15, but also the AR-18. Let's not go too far down that rabbit hole. But the Colt 715, what are the differences? Well, as we hopefully caught some of you out with on social media, uh, and I'm sure others did spot, A1 pattern rear sights. So you've got ostensibly an M16A2, but they are simple, two-position aperture sights. No messing, two choices for, for you know, you're not fiddling with your rear sight as the enemy close on you. No worries over training, that kind of thing. Now that's interesting because in the documentation I've been looking at, this pattern of sight was criticized back in the 60s as um, it, you know, not, not what they would have wanted, which is interesting because the SLR had a very similar setup sites-wise. But anyway, clearly that was a lone voice because this became the sort of more widely issued. We're talking a few thousand rifles here, we're not talking an absolute ton, but nonetheless. So the sights are different. Um, also, 
in common with the 701, which is this but automatic, the 715 is de facto auto setting on the receiver. Um, you can see it on this side, obviously the switch is on the left side. So instead of saying burst, it says auto because it doesn't have that finicky three round burst mechanism that a lot of people hate. So some people are already cheering because you've got two features that uh, some people who don't like the A2 very much um, don't have to worry about. But it has just about all of the other A2 features. It has the longer butt stock, it has the uh, slightly modernized forward assist, it has the A2 pistol grip, the A2 flash suppressor, which interestingly on this gun has been timed off to one side. Um, I assume that's been deliberately done, been done deliberately by a unit armorer before this came to us. That would act a little bit like the slant um, compensator on an AKM and push the muzzle away from recoil. Um, I think I've seen that done on a couple of other civilian owned ARs, but yeah, interesting. Overall, we have this black finish. Now, this is the same black Suncorite paint that was on um, the SLR and various other weapons. So that immediately means you can go, ah, if it's, if it's a, a sort of mattish satin black AR, it might be a British one if you're coming across rifles or parts, depending on where you live in the world. The real clincher, though, um, well... There are other armed forces that probably did this. I'm just trying to think what the IDF, the Israeli Defence Force, has done. But definitively, the British British service AR-15s, and I'm including the M16 in that because it's an AR-15, they have a serial number on the upper receiver as well as the lower. And from the earliest times, all the document, documentation says, because this gun can be separated into two halves so easily, we need a serial number on the upper receiver. Uh, or the body, as we might have called it, if we'd adopted it more formally. Because although these were adopted formally, I've contradicted myself, but I'll explain. They weren't adopted, they weren't sort of type classified under the L, the land service system. So there was never an L1A1 556 rifle. Um, they used their American names. So AR-15 to begin with, then M16A1, then M16A2. Bit of a nightmare for the logistics people to then track the different models of AR-15 that were in service overlapping with each other. Um, the AR-15, the, the pre-A1 the pre AR-15s and the A1s were cannibalized together. Uh, we've also seen A2 uppers on other lowers. and That's a standard story around the world. Whoever uses AR-15 pattern rifles ends up doing a bit of a mix master thing with them, um, depending on their size, funding, needs. So, <laughs> all a bit confusing and perhaps a bit nerdy even for this series, but those features together allow you to identify a British AR-15, specifically M16A2 in this case. Now, there are markings as well. So if anyone's in the position to be coming across components, just for belt and braces, we'll show you some markings as well. So, standard British practice is also to put serial number on the bolt carrier as well. So upper, lower, and bolt carrier. That's pretty clear on this one. This is the um, sort of black uh, phosphate, pretty, sta I believe, standard to the A2 um, family. We've then got... I don't know if we can just be able to see this without me disassembling the, the bolt carrier group. Uh, well, first of all, next to that serial number, pressed into the metal through the finish, a little pair of crossed pennants. See those? Yeah. And then again, there's that serial number and those crossed pennants again on the bolt itself. Partially concealed, because um, I don't have to find a cartridge to push out the cotter pin, but... <laughs> Um, so, this is pretty standard, uh, British military proof. Those crossed pennants are British military proof, which denotes typically a service weapon or maybe a test and evaluation example. This setup, so an A2 rifle with the heavy barrel, the modernized furniture, the cartridge case deflector, but the A1 rear sight and the automatic lower receiver 
That would sound familiar to anyone from the Canadian Armed Forces because that's what was adopted as the C7 rifle in 1982. And that's when this model has just been finalized, basically. Um, now, I believe the Colt Model 715 came first. DeMarco in Canada licensed that from Colt rather than the other way around. But it's interesting that we had a bit of convergent procurement, effectively, in that the, the British forces for non-SF units, effectively, purchased what was the, essentially the same rifle as Canada had adopted, or adopted about the same time, as the C7 rifle, which is still going in modernised form, whereas these guys have been replaced by, ironically enough, DeMarco products, notably a version of the C8, as the L119A1, and for SF, they're on the A2. But uh, hopefully an interesting dive into a little bit of the research I've been doing on the British AR-15. I give it the scare quotes because the UK never made AR-15s of any kind. We only ever purchased them. Uh, you might argue that we should have done, given what happened with SA-80. Thanks very much for watching, guys. Um, there are various ways that you can engage with the collection here at the Royal Armouries, this being one of them. Um, you can also head over to the GameSpot YouTube channel for more of me talking about guns. Um, we have our own social media outlets, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, there's our website, of course, our online collection that you can peruse. Uh, most of all, though, we'd very much like you to come and visit us at one of our three sites here in the UK, up here at Leeds, uh, down at Fort Nelson on the south coast, or indeed at the famous Tower of London, where all of the arms and army you can see there are ours, which is nice. <laughs> so we'll see you again next time.